book one chapter seventeen of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter seventeen the salutation given to saint elizabeth by the queen of heaven and the sanctification of john when the most holy mother mary arrived at the house of zacharias the precursor of christ had completed the sixth month of his conception in the womb of saint elizabeth the body of the child john had already attained a state of great natural perfection much greater than that of other children on account of the miracle of his conception by a sterile mother and on account of the intention of the most high to make him the depositary of greater sanctification than other men matthew chapter eleven verse eleven yet at this time his soul was yet filled with the darkness of sin which he had contracted in the same way as the other children of adam the first and common father of the human race and as according to the universal and general law mortals cannot receive the light of grace before they have issued forth to the light of the sun romans chapter five verse seven so after the first the original sin contracted by our nature the womb of the mother must serve as a dungeon or prison for all of us who have laden upon ourselves this guilt of our father and head adam christ our lord resolved to anticipate this great blessing of his prophet and precursor by conferring the light of his grace and justification upon him six months after his conception by saint elizabeth in order that he might be distinguished as well in holiness as he was in his office of precursor and baptist after the first salutation of elizabeth by the most holy mary the two cousins retired as i have said at the end of the preceding chapter and immediately the mother of grace saluted anew her cousin saying may god save thee my dearest cousin and may his divine light communicate to thee grace and life luke chapter one verse forty at the sound of most holy mary's voice saint elizabeth was filled by the holy spirit and so enlightened interiorly that in one instant she perceived the most exalted mysteries and sacraments these emotions and those at the same time were felt by the child john in the womb of his mother were caused by the presence of the word made flesh in the bridal chamber of mary's womb for making use of the voice of mary as his instrument he as redeemer began from that place to use the power given to him by the eternal father for the salvation and justification of the souls and since he now operated as man though as yet of the diminutive size of one conceived eight days before he assumed in admirable humility the form and posture of one praying and beseeching the father he asked in earnest prayer for the justification of his future precursor and obtained it at the hands of the blessed trinity saint john was the third one for whom our redeemer made special petition since his presence in the womb of his mother his mother was the first for whom he gave thanks and prayed to the father next in order was her spouse saint joseph for whom the incarnate word offered up his prayers as we have said in the twelfth chapter and the third one was the precursor saint john whom the lord mentioned by name in his prayers to the father such was the great good fortune and privilege of saint john that christ our lord presented to the eternal father the merits of his passion and death to be endured for men and in view thereof he requested the sanctification of this soul he appointed and set apart this child as one who is to be born holy as his precursor and as a witness of his coming into the world john chapter one verse seven as one who was to prepare the hearts of his people in order that they might recognize and receive him as the messiah he ordained that for such an exalted ministry the precursor should receive all the graces gifts and favors which are befitting and proportionate to his office all this the father granted just as the only begotten had requested it of him this happened before the most holy mary had put her salutation into words at the pronunciation of the words mentioned above god looked upon the child in the womb of saint elizabeth and gave it perfect use of reason enlightening it with his divine light in order that he might prepare himself by foreknowledge for the blessings which he was to receive together with this preparation he was sanctified from original sin 
made an adopted son of God, and filled with the most abundant graces of the Holy Ghost, and with the plenitude of all his gifts. His faculties were sanctified, subjected, and subordinated to reason, thus verifying in himself what the archangel Gabriel had said to Zacharias, that his son would be filled with the Holy Ghost from the womb of his mother. Luke chapter 1 verse 17 at the same time the fortunate child looking through the walls of the maternal womb as through clear glass upon the incarnate word and assuming a kneeling posture adored his redeemer and creator whom he beheld in most holy mary as if enclosed in a chamber made of the purest crystal this was the movement of jubilation which was felt by his mother elizabeth as coming from the infant in her womb luke chapter one verse forty four many other acts of virtue the child john performed during this interview exercising faith hope charity worship gratitude humility devotion and all the other virtues possible to him there from that moment he began to merit and grow in sanctity without ever losing it and without ever ceasing to exercise it with all the vigor of grace saint elizabeth was instructed at the same time in the mystery of the incarnation the sanctification of her own son and the sacramental purpose of this new wonder she also became aware of the virginal purity and of the dignity of the most holy mary on this occasion the heavenly queen being absorbed in the vision of the divinity and of the mysteries operated by it through her most holy son became entirely godlike filled with the clear light of the divine gifts which she participated and thus filled with majesty saint elizabeth saw her she saw the word made man as through a most pure and clear glass in the virginal chamber lying as it were on a couch of burning and enlivened crystal the efficacious instrument of all these wonderful effects was the voice of most holy mary as powerful as it was sweet in the hearing of the lord all this force was as it were only an outflow of that which was contained in those most powerful words fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum by which she had drawn the eternal word from the bosom of the father down to her soul and into her womb filled with admiration at what she saw and heard in regard to these divine mysteries saint elizabeth was wrapped in the joy of the holy ghost and looking upon the queen of the world and what was contained in her she burst forth in loud voice of praise pronouncing the words reported to us by saint luke blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb and whence is this to me that the mother of my lord should come to me for behold as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears the infant in my womb leaped for joy and blessed art thou that has believed because those things shall be accomplished which were spoken to thee by the lord in these prophetic words saint elizabeth rehearsed the noble privileges of most holy mary perceiving by the divine light what the power of the lord had done in her what he now performed and what he was to accomplish through her in time to come all this also the child john perceived and understood while listening to the words of his mother for she was enlightened for the purpose of his sanctification and since he could not from his place in the womb bless and thank her by word of mouth she both for herself and for her son extolled the most holy mary as being the instrument of their good fortune these words of praise pronounced by saint elizabeth were referred by the mother of wisdom and humility to the creator and in the sweetest and softest voice she intoned the magnificat as recorded by saint luke chapter one verses forty six to fifty five my soul doth magnify the lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in god my saviour because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid for behold from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed because he that is mighty hath done great things to me and holy is his name and his mercy is from generation unto generation to them that fear him and he hath showed might in his arm he hath scattered the proud in the conceit of their heart he hath put down the mighty from their seat and hath exalted the humble he hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away he hath received israel his servant being mindful of his mercy as he spoke to his fathers to abraham and his seed for ever 
just as saint elizabeth was the first one who heard the sweet canticle from the mouth of most holy mary so she was also the first one who understood it and by means of her infused knowledge commented upon it she penetrated some of the great mysteries which its authoress expressed therein in so few sentences the soul of most holy mary magnified the lord for the excellence of his infinite essence to him she referred and yielded all glory and praise first letter to saint timothy chapter one verse seventeen both for the beginning and the accomplishment of her works she knew and confessed that in god alone every creature should glory and rejoice since he alone is their entire happiness and salvation second letter to the corinthians chapter ten verse seventeen she confessed also the equity and magnificence of the most high in attending to the humble and in conferring upon them his abundant spirit of divine love psalm one hundred thirty seven verse six she saw how worthy of mortals it is to perceive understand and ponder the gifts that were conferred on the humility of her whom all nations were to call blessed and how all the humble ones each one according to his degree could share the same good fortune by one word she also expressed all the mercies benefits and blessings which the almighty showered upon her in his holy and wonderful name for she calls them altogether great things since there was nothing small about anything that referred to this great queen and lady and as the mercies of the most high overflowed from mary's plenitude to the whole human race and as she was the portal of heaven through which they issued and continue to issue and through which we are to enter into the participation of the divinity therefore she confessed that the mercy of the lord in regard to her is spread out over all the generations communicating itself to them that fear him and just as the infinite mercies raised up the humble and seek out those that fear god so also the powerful arm of divine justice scatters and destroys those who are proud in the mind of their heart and hurls them from their thrones in order to set in their place the poor and lowly this justice of the lord was exercised in wonderful splendor and glory upon the chief of all the proud lucifer and his followers when the almighty arm of god scattered and hurled them because they themselves precipitated themselves from their exalted seats which befitted their angelic natures and their graces and which they occupied according to the original decree of the divine love isaiah chapter fourteen apocalypse chapter twelve for by it he intended that all should be blessed first letter to saint timothy chapter two verse four while they in trying to ascend in their vain pride to positions which they neither could attain nor should aspire to on the contrary cast themselves from those which they occupied isaiah chapter fourteen verse thirteen in their arrogance they were found opposed to the just and inscrutable judgments of the lord which scattered and cast down the proud angel and all his followers apocalypse chapter twelve verse eight in their place were installed the humble of heart through the mediation of most holy mary the mother and the treasure house of his ancient mercies for the same reason this divine lady says and proclaims that god enriches the needy filling them with the abundance of his treasures of grace and glory and those that are rich in their own estimation and presumptuous arrogance and those who satisfy their heart with the false goods which the world esteems as riches and happiness the most high has banished and does banish from his presence because they are void of the truth which cannot enter into hearts filled and occupied with falsehood and deceit he received his servants and his children the people of israel remembering his mercies in order to teach them wherein prudence truth and understanding baruch chapter three verse fourteen wherein free and abundant life and nourishment wherein the light of the eyes and peace consists he taught them the way of prudence and the hidden paths of wisdom and discipline which is concealed from the princes of the gentiles and is not known to the powerful who dominate over the beasts of the earth and entertain themselves and play with the birds of the air and heap up treasures of gold and silver nor can the sons of agar and the inhabitants of teman who are the wise and the proudly prudent of this world 
ever attain this wisdom. But to those that are sons of the light. Letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verse 7. And who are sons of Abraham by faith, hope, and obedience? The Most High distributes it. For in this manner has it been promised to his posterity and his spiritual children, made secure by the blessed and happy fruit of the virginal womb of the Most Holy Mary. St. Elizabeth, looking upon Mary the Queen of Creation, understood these hidden mysteries, and not only those, which I am able to express here, did this fortunate matron understand, but many more and greater sacraments, which my understanding cannot comprehend, nor do I wish to dilate upon all that had been shown to me, lest I unduly extend this history. But the sweet discourses and conversations, which these two holy and discreet ladies held with each other, reminded me of the two seraphim, which Isaiah saw above the throne of the Most High, repeating the divine and always new canticle, holy, 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 etc. While they covered their head with one pair of wings, their feet with another, and flew with the third pair. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 2. It is certain that the inflamed love of these two holy women exceeded that of all the seraphim, and Mary by herself loved more than they all together. They were consumed in the flame of divine love, extending the two wings of their hearts in order to manifest to each other their love, and in order to soar into the most exalted intelligence of the mysteries of the Most High. With two more wings of rarest knowledge, they covered their faces, because both of them discussed and contemplated the sacrament of the king. Tobias, chapter 12, verse 7. Guarding its secrets within themselves all their lives. Also because they restrained their discourse and subjected it to their devoted faith without giving scope to proud inquisitiveness. They also covered the feet of the Lord and their own with the third pair of seraphic wings, because they were lowered and annihilated in their own humble estimation of themselves at the sight of such great majesty. Moreover, since most holy Mary enclosed within her virginal womb the God of majesty himself, we can with reason and with literal truth say that she covered the seat where the Lord sat enthroned. When it was time to come forth from their retirement, St. Elizabeth offered herself and her whole family and all her house for the service of the Queen of Heaven, she asked her to accept, as a quiet retreat, the room which she herself was accustomed to use for her prayers, and which was much retired and accommodated to that purpose. The heavenly princess accepted the chamber with humble thanks, and made use of it by recollecting herself and sleeping therein, and no one ever entered it except the two cousins. As for the rest, she offered to serve and assist Elizabeth as a handmaid, for she said, that this was the purpose of visiting her and consoling her. Oh, what friendship is so true, so sweet and inseparable, as that which is formed by the great bond of the divine love! How admirable is the Lord in manifesting this great sacrament of the Incarnation to three women before he would make it known to anyone else in the human race! For the first was Saint Anne, as I have said in its place. The second one was her daughter and the mother of the Word, Most Holy Mary. The third one was St. Elizabeth, and conjointly with her, her son, for he being yet in the womb of his mother, cannot be considered as distinct from her. Thus, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, as St. Paul says. The Most Holy Mary and Elizabeth came forth from their retirement at nightfall, having passed a long time together, and the queen saw Zacharias standing before her in his muteness, and she asked him for his blessing, as from a priest of the Lord, which the saint also gave to her. Yet although she tenderly pitied him for his affliction, she did not exert her power to cure him, because she knew the mysterious occasion of his dumbness, yet she offered a prayer for him. St. Elizabeth, who already knew the good fortune of the most chaste spouse, Joseph, although he himself as yet was not aware of it, entertained and served him with great reverence and highest esteem. After staying three days in the house of Zacharias, however, he asked permission of his heavenly spouse Mary to return to Nazareth and leave her in the company of St. Elizabeth in order to assist her in her pregnancy. The holy husband left them with the understanding that he was to return in order to accompany the queen home as soon as they should give him notice, 
saint elizabeth offered him some presents to take home with him but he would take only a small part of them yielding only to their earnest solicitations for this man of god was not only a lover of poverty but was possessed of a magnanimous and noble heart therewith he pursued his way back to nazareth taking along with him the little beast of burden which they had brought with them at home in the absence of his spouse he was served by a neighboring woman and cousin of his who also when most holy mary was at home was wont to come and go on the necessary errands outside of the house instruction which the queen and lady gave me my daughter in order that thy heart may be ever more and more inflamed with the desire of gaining the grace and friendship of god i wish very much that thou grow in the knowledge of the dignity excellence and happiness of a soul that has been endowed with this privilege however remember that it is so admirable and of so great a value that thou canst not comprehend it even if i would explain it to thee and much less canst thou express it in words look upon the lord and contemplate him by means of the divine light which thou receivest and then thou wilt understand that the lord performs a great work in justifying a soul than in having created all the orbs of heaven and the whole earth with all the beauty and perfection contained therein and if on account of the wonders which creatures are able in part to perceive in these works by the senses they are impressed with the greatness and power of god what would they say and think if they could see with the eyes of their soul the preciousness and beauty of grace in so many creatures who are capable of receiving them there are no terms of human language equal to the task of expressing what participations and perfections of god are contained in sanctifying grace it is little to say that it is more pure and spotless than the snow more refulgent than the sun more precious than gold or precious stones more charming more amiable and pleasing than all the most delightful feasts and entertainments and more beautiful than all that in its entirety can be imagined or desired by the creatures take notice also of the ugliness of sin in order that by the opposite thou mayest come to so much the better understanding of the beauty of grace for neither darknesses nor rottenness nor the most horrible the most dreadful nor the foulest of creatures can ever be compared to sin and its ugliness the martyrs and saints understood much of this mystery hebrews chapter eleven verse thirty six who in order to secure the beauty of grace and preserve themselves from the ruin of sin did not fear fire nor wild beasts nor the sword nor torments nor prisons ignominies pains afflictions nor death itself nor prolonged and perpetual suffering for to escape all these must be counted for little or nothing and must scarcely be thought of in comparison with one degree of grace which souls may attain even though they be the most abject of the whole world all this the men who esteem and seek after the fugitive and apparent beauty of creatures are ignorant of and whatever does not present to them this deceitful beauty is for them vile and contemptible thou perceivest therefore something of the greatness of the blessing which the incarnate word conferred upon his precursor in the womb of his mother and because saint john recognized it he leaped for joy and exultation in the womb of his mother thou wilt also see what thou thyself must do and suffer in order to attain this happiness and in order not to lose it or in the least impair this most precious beauty by any fault nor retard its consummation by any imperfection no matter how small i wish that in imitation of my cousin elizabeth thou do not enter into any friendship with any human creatures except those with whom thou canst and shouldst converse about the works of the most high and of his mysteries and with whom thou canst learn to pursue the true path of his divine pleasure although thou art engaged in important undertakings and works do not forget or omit thy spiritual exercises and the strictness of a perfect life for this must not only be preserved and watched over when all things go smoothly but also under the greatest adversity difficulty and labor for imperfect human nature takes occasion of the slightest circumstance to relax its vigilance End of chapter seventeen book one chapter eighteen of the mystical city of god volume two 
by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter eighteen most holy mary arranges the order of her daily exercises in the house of zacharias some incidents in her intercourse with saint elizabeth when the precursor john had been sanctified and saint elizabeth his mother had been endowed with such great gifts and blessings and when thus the principal object of mary's visit was fulfilled the great queen proceeded to arrange her daily life in the house of zacharias for her occupations could not be uniformly the same as those she was accustomed to in her own house in order to direct her desire by the guidance of the holy ghost she retired and placed herself in the presence of the most high asking him as usual to guide her and direct her in that which she was to do during her stay in the house of his servants elizabeth and zacharias so that she might in all things be pleasing to him and fulfil entirely his pleasure the lord heard her petition and answered her saying my spouse and my dove i will direct all thy actions and i will direct thy footsteps in the fulfilment of my service and pleasure and i will make known to thee the day on which i wish thee to return to thy home in the meanwhile remain in the house of my servant elizabeth and converse with her as for the rest continue thy exercises and prayers especially for the salvation of men and pray also that i withhold my justice in dealing with their incessant offences against my bounty conjointly with thy prayers thou shalt offer to me the lamb without spot first letter of peter chapter one verse nineteen which thou bearest in thy womb and which takes away the sins of the world john chapter one verse twenty nine let these now be thy occupations in conformity with this instruction and new mandate of the most high the princess of heaven ordered all her occupations in the house of her cousin elizabeth she rose up at midnight in accordance with her former custom spending the hours in the continued contemplation of the divine mysteries and giving to waking and sleep the time which most perfectly and exactly agreed with the natural state and conditions of her body in labor and repose she continued to receive new favors illuminations exaltations and caresses of the lord during these three months she had many visions of the divinity mostly abstractive in kind more frequent still were the visions of the most holy humanity of the word in its hypostatic union for her virginal womb in which she bore him served her as her continual altar and sanctuary she beheld the daily growth of that sacred body by this experience and by the sacraments which every day were made manifest to her in the boundless fields of the divine power and essence the spirit of this exalted lady expanded to vast proportions many times she would have been consumed and have died by the violence of her affections if she had not been strengthened by the power of the lord to these occupations which were concealed from all she added those which the service and consolation of her cousin elizabeth demanded although she did not apply one moment more to them than charity required these fulfilled she returned immediately to her solitude and recollection where she could pour out the more freely her spirit before the lord no less solicitous was she to occupy herself interiorly while she was engaged for many hours in manual occupations and in all this the precursor was so fortunate that the great queen with her own hands sewed and prepared the swaddling clothes and coverlets in which he was to be wrapped and reared for his mother elizabeth in her maternal solicitude and attention had secured for st john this good fortune humbly asking this favor of the heavenly queen mary with incredible love and subjection complied with her request in order to exercise herself in obedience to her cousin whom she wished to serve as the lowliest handmaid for in humility and obedience most holy mary always surpassed all men although saint elizabeth sought to anticipate her in much that belonged to her service yet in her rare prudence and wisdom mary knew how to forestall her cousin always gaining the triumph of humility in this regard a great and sweet competition arose between the two cousins which was very pleasing to the most high and wonderful in the sight of the angels 
for saint elizabeth was very solicitous and attentive in serving our lady and great queen and in commanding also the same service to be rendered her by all the inmates of the house but she who was the teacher of virtues most holy mary being still more attentive and eager to serve met and diverted the anxieties of her cousin saying my dear cousin i find my consolation in being commanded and in obeying during all my life it is not good that thy love should deprive me of the comfort i feel therein since i am the younger one it is proper that i serve not only thee as my mother but all in thy house deal with me as with thy servant as long as i am in thy company saint elizabeth answered my beloved lady it seems much more that i obey thee and that thou command and direct me in all things and this i ask of thee with greater justice for if thou the mistress wishes to exercise humility i on my part owe worship and reverence to my god and lord whom thou bearest in thy virginal womb and i know that thy dignity is worthy of all honour and reverence and the most prudent virgin rejoined my son and lord did not choose me for his mother in order that i receive reverence as mistress for his kingdom is not of this world john chapter eighteen verse thirty six nor did he come into it in order to be served but to serve matthew chapter twenty verse twenty eight and to suffer and to teach obedience and humility to mortals matthew chapter eleven verse twenty nine condemning fastidiousness and pride since therefore his majesty teaches me this and the highest calls himself the ignominy of men psalm twenty one verse twenty two how can i who am his slave and do not merit the company of creatures consent that thou serve me who art formed according to his image and likeness genesis chapter one verse twenty seven saint elizabeth still insisted and said my mistress and protectress this is true for those who do not know the sacrament which is enclosed in thee but i who have without merit been informed by the lord will be very blamable in his eyes if i do not give him in thee the veneration which is due to him as god and to thee as his mother for it is just that i serve both as a slave serves his masters but to this the most holy mary answered my dear sister this reverence which thou owest and desirest to give is due to the lord whom i bear within my womb for he is the true and highest good and our redeemer but as far as i am concerned who am a mere creature and among creatures only a poor worm look upon me as i am in myself although thou shouldest adore the creator who chose my poor self as his dwelling by his divine enlightenment thou shalt give unto god what is due to him and allow me to perform that which pertains to me namely to serve and to be below all this i ask of thee for my consolation and in the name of the lord whom i bear within me in such blessed and happy contentions most holy mary and her cousin elizabeth passed some of their time but the divine prudence of our queen caused in her such an alertness and ingenuity in matters concerning humility and obedience that she never failed to find means and ways of obeying and of being commanded however during all the time in which she stayed with saint elizabeth all this was done in such a way that both according to their condition treated with the highest respect the sacrament of the king which had been entrusted to their knowledge and which was deposited in most holy mary this high respect in mary was such as befitted the mother and the mistress of all virtue and grace and in elizabeth such as was worthy of the prudent matron so highly enlightened by the holy spirit by this light she wisely directed her behavior in regard to the mother of god yielding to her wishes and obeying her in whatever she could and at the same time reverencing her dignity and in it her creator in her inmost heart she made the intention that if she were obliged to give any command to the mother of god she would do it only in order to obey and satisfy her wishes and whenever she did it she asked permission and pardon of the lord at the same time never ordering anything by direct command but always by request and she would use greater earnestness only in such things as were conducive to mary's convenience as for instance that she take some sleep or nourishment 
she also asked mary to make a few articles for her with her own hands mary complied but saint elizabeth never made use of them except to preserve them with the greatest veneration in this way most holy mary put into practice the doctrine of the eternal word who humiliated himself so far that being the form of the eternal father the figure of his substance true god of the true god he nevertheless assumed the form and condition of a servant hebrews chapter one verse three letter to the philippians chapter two verses six and seven this lady was the mother of god queen of all creation superior in excellence and dignity to all creatures and yet she remained the humble servant of the least of them and never would she accept homage and service as if due to her nor did she ever exalt herself or fail to judge of herself in the most humble manner what shall we now say of our most execrable presumption and pride since full of the abomination of sin we are so senseless as to claim for ourselves with dreadful insanity the homage and veneration of all the world and if this is denied us we quickly lose the little sense which our passions have left us this whole heavenly history bears the stamp of humility and is a condemnation of our pride and since it is not my office to teach or correct but to be taught and to be corrected i beseech and pray all the faithful children of light to place this example before their eyes for our humiliation it would not have been difficult for the lord to preserve his most holy mother from such extreme lowliness and from the occasions in which she embraced it he could have exalted her before creatures ordaining that she be renowned honored and respected by all just as he knew how to procure homage and renown for others as Asuerus did for mardocius perhaps if this had been left to the judgment of men they would have so managed that a woman more holy than all the hierarchies of heaven and who bore in her womb the creator of the angels and of the heavens should be surrounded by a continual guard of honor withdrawn from the gaze of men and receiving the homage of all the world it would have seemed to them unworthy of her to engage in humble and servile occupations or not to have all things done only at her command or to refuse homage or not to exercise fullest authority so narrow is human wisdom if that can be called wisdom which is so limited but such fallacy cannot creep into the true science of the saints which is communicated to them by the infinite wisdom of the creator and which esteems at their just weight and price these honors without confounding the values of the creatures the most high would have denied his beloved mother much and benefited her little if he had deprived and withdrawn from her the occasion of exercising the profoundest humility and had instead exposed her to the exterior applause of men it would also be a great loss to the world to be without this school of humility and this example for the humiliation and confusion of its pride from the time of her receiving the lord as her guest in her house though yet in the womb of the virgin mother the holy elizabeth was much favored by god by the continued conversation and the familiar intercourse with the heavenly queen in proportion as she grew in the knowledge and understanding of the mysteries of the incarnation this great matron advanced in all manner of sanctity as one who draws it from its very fountain a few times she merited to see most holy mary during her prayers ravished and raised from the ground and altogether filled with divine splendor and beauty so that she could not have looked upon her face nor remain alive in her presence if she had not been strengthened by the divine power on these occasions and at others whenever she could be witness of them without attracting the attention of most holy mary she prostrated herself and knelt in her presence and adored the incarnate word in the virginal temple of the most holy mother all the mysteries which became known to her by the divine light and by the intercourse with the great queen saint elizabeth sealed up in her bosom being a most faithful depositary and prudent secretary of that which was confided to her only with her son john and with zacharias during the short time in which he lived after the birth of his son saint elizabeth conversed to some extent concerning those sacraments which had become known to all but in all this she acted as a courageous wise and very holy woman instruction which the queen most holy mary gave me my daughter the favors of the most high and the knowledge of his divine mysteries 
in the attentive souls engenders a kind of love and esteem of humility which raises them up with a strong and sweet force like that which causes fire to ascend like the gravity which causes a stone to fall each of them striving to reach its own and natural sphere this is done by the true light which places the creature in the possession of a clear knowledge of its own self and attributes the graces to the proper source whence all perfect things come letter of st james chapter one verse seventeen and thus it brings all things into correct balance and this is the most proper order of right reason which overthrows and as it were exerts violence against the false presumption of mortals on account of this presumption of pride the heart wherein it lives cannot strive after contempt nor bear it nor can it suffer a superior over itself and is offended even at equals it violently opposes all in order to place itself alone above all fellow creatures but the humble heart is abased in proportion to the benefits it received and in its interior quietly grows a desire or an ardent hunger for self-abasement and for the last place it is violently disturbed in not finding itself esteemed as the inferior of all and in being deprived of humiliation in me my dearest thou wilt find exhibited the practical application of this doctrine since none of the favors and blessings which the right hand of the most high lavished upon me were insignificant yet never was my heart inflated with presumption above itself psalm 110 verse 1 nor did it ever know anything else than to desire to be abased and occupy the last place among all creatures the imitation of this i desire especially of thee let thy ambition be to take the last place to live in subjection to all others abased and considered as useless in the presence of the lord and of men thou must judge thyself as less than the dust of the earth itself thou canst not deny that in no generation has any one been more favored than thou and no one has merited these favors less than thou how then wilt thou make any return for this great debt of gratitude if thou dost not humiliate thyself below all others and more than all the sons of adam and if thou dost not awaken within thyself exalted and loving sentiments concerning humility it is good to obey the prelates and instructors therefore do it always but i desire that thou go much farther and that thou obey the most insignificant of thy fellow-beings in all that is not sinful and in such a way as if thou wert obeying the highest of thy superiors and i desire that in this matter thou be very earnest as i was during my earthly life thou must however be circumspect in regard to the obedience to thy inferiors so that they may not knowing of thy anxiousness to obey in all things seek to induce thee to obey in things unseemly and unbecoming thou canst do much good by giving them the good and orderly example of obedience without causing them to lose any of their subjection and without derogating from thy authority as their superioress if any disagreeable accident or injury should happen which affects thee alone accept it gladly without so much as moving thy lips in self-defense or making any complaints whatever is an injury to god do thou reprehend without mixing up any of thy own grievances with those of his majesty for thou shouldest never find any cause for self-defence but always be ready to defend the honour of god but neither in the one nor the other allow thyself to be moved by disorderly anger and passion i wish also that thou use great prudence in hiding and concealing the favours of the lord for the sacrament of the king is not to be lightly manifested tobias chapter twelve verse seven nor are carnal men capable or worthy of the mysteries of the holy ghost first letter to the corinthians chapter two verse fourteen in all things imitate and follow me since thou wishest to be my beloved daughter this thou wilt attain by obeying me and thou wilt induce the almighty to strengthen and direct thy steps to that which i desire to accomplish in thee do not resist him but dispose and prepare thy heart sweetly and quickly to obey his light and grace let grace not be void in thee second letter to the corinthians chapter six verse one but labor diligently and let thy actions be performed in all perfection end of chapter eighteen
Book One, Chapter Nineteen of the Mystical City of God, Volume Two, by the Venerable Sister Mary of Jesus of Agreda. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, Chapter Nineteen of Some Conversations which Most Holy Mary held with her angels in the house of Saint Elizabeth, and of others which she held with her cousin. The plenitude of the wisdom and grace of Most Holy Mary being of such immense capacity, could not remain idle at any point of time, nor in any place or occasion. For it gave forth the plenitude of all perfection, active at all times and seasons, to the fullest extent of duty and possibility, without ever falling short of the holiest and the most excellent in virtue. And as in all places, she acted the part of a pilgrim on earth, and of an inhabitant of heaven, and as she herself was the intellectual and most glorious heaven, the living temple, in which God himself had made his habitation, so she also carried with her her own oratory and sanctuary, and in this respect there was for her no difference between her own house and that of her cousin Elizabeth, nor could any other place, time or occupation, be a hindrance to her in this regard. She was placed above all things, and without any outside claim, she incessantly devoted herself to the influence of the love which was continually in her sight. Yet at the same time, she conversed with the creatures at opportune times, and treated with them according as occasion required, giving as much attention to them, as the most prudent mistress could fittingly spare for each in particular. And as her most frequent conversings, during the three months, in which she remained in the house of Zacharias, were with St. Elizabeth and with the holy angels of her guard, I shall relate in this chapter something of that which formed the subject of her conferences with them, and also mention other things which happened in her intercourse with the saint. When she was left alone and free to herself, our heavenly princess passed many hours, ravished and elevated in divine contemplations and visions. Sometimes during these trances, sometimes outside of them, she was accustomed to converse with her angels about the sacraments and mysteries of her interior love. One day, soon after she had arrived at the house of Zacharias, she spoke to them in the following manner. Heavenly spirits, my guardians and companions, ambassadors of the Most High, and luminaries of his divinity, come and strengthen my heart, which is captured and wounded by his divine love, for it is afflicted with its own limitations, in that it cannot properly respond to the obligations which are known to it, and which dictate its desires. Come, ye supernal princes, and praise with me the admirable name of the Lord, and let us magnify his holy judgments and operations. Help this poor little worm to praise its maker, who condescends kindly to look upon its insignificance. Let us talk of the wonders of my spouse. Let us discuss the beauty of my Lord, of his beloved Son, let my heart find relief in uniting its inmost aspirations to your own, my friends and companions, for you do know the secrets of my treasure, which the Lord has deposited within me in the narrowness of so fragile and constrained a vase. Great are these sacraments and admirable these mysteries, and I contemplate them with sweet affection, but their supernal greatness overwhelms me. The profundity and greatness of my love overpowers me, even while they inflame my heart." In the ardor of my soul, I cannot rest satisfied and find no repose, for my desires surpass all that I can accomplish, and my obligations are greater than my desires. I am dissatisfied with myself, because I do not exert myself as much as I desire, because I do not desire to accomplish as much as I should, and because I find myself continually falling short, and vanquished by the greatness of the returns, which are due." Ye heavenly seraphim, listen to my loving anxieties. I am fallen sick with love. Canticles, chapter 2, verse 5. Open to me your bosoms, whence the beauty of my God is flashed forth, in order that the splendors of his light and the visions of his loveliness may replenish the life which wastes away in his love. Mother of our Creator and our Mistress, answered the holy angels. Thou possessest truly the Almighty and our highest good, since thou hast him so closely bound to thee, and art his true spouse and mother. Rejoice in him, and keep him with thee for all eternity. Thou art the spouse and the mother of the God of love, and as in thee is the only cause and fountain of life. 
no one can live with him as thou our queen and mistress do not seek to find repose in a love so inflamed for thy state and condition of a pilgrim do not permit thy love to attain the repose of perfect consummation nor will it cease to aspire to new and greater increase of merit and triumph thy obligations surpass without comparison those of all the nations but they are to increase and grow continually never will thy so vastly inflamed love equal its object since it is eternal and infinite and without measure in its perfection thou shalt always be happily vanquished by its greatness for no one can comprehend it only he himself comprehends himself and loves himself in the measure in which he deserves to be loved eternally o lady shalt thou find in him more to desire and more to love since that is required by the essence of his greatness and of our beatitude in these colloquies and conferences the fire of divine love was more and more enkindled in the heart of most holy mary in her was exactly fulfilled the command of the lord leviticus chapter six verse twelve that in his tabernacle and on his altar should burn continually the fire of the holocaust and that the priests of the ancient law should see to its perpetual nourishment and maintenance this precept was executed to the letter in the most holy mary for in her were jointly contained the altar and the new high priest christ our lord who nourished and augmented its flame day by day by administering new material in favors blessings graces and communications of his divinity while the exalted lady on her part contributed her ceaseless exertions which were ineffably enhanced in value by the continual flow of the graces and sanctity of the lord from the moment in which this lady entered into the world this conflagration of his divine love took its rise in order never to be extinguished on this altar through all the eternities of god himself for as lasting as this eternity and as continuous was and will be the fire of this living sanctuary at other times she spoke and conversed with the holy angels when they appeared to her in human forms as i have said in several places most frequently this conversation turned about the mystery of the incarnate word and in this she manifested so profound a knowledge inciting the holy scriptures and the prophets that she caused wonder even in the angels on one occasion in speaking to them of these venerable sacraments she said my lords servants of the most high and his friends my heart is pierced and torn by arrows of grief when i meditate on what the sacred scriptures say of my most holy son or what isaiah and jeremiah wrote genesis chapter twenty two verse two isaiah chapter thirty three verse two jeremiah chapter eleven verse eighteen concerning the most bitter pains and torments in store for him solomon says wisdom chapter two verse twenty that they shall condemn him to a most ignominious death and the prophets always speak in weighty and superlative terms of his passion and death which all are to be fulfilled in him o oh, were it the will of his majesty that i live at that time in order to offer myself to die instead of the author of my life my soul is sorely afflicted in the consideration of these infallible truths and that my god and my lord should come forth from my womb only in order to suffer o oh, who will guard him and defend him against his enemies o oh, tell me ye heavenly princes by what services or by what means can i induce the eternal father to divert the rigor of his justice upon me in order that the innocent who cannot have any guilt upon him may be freed from punishment well do i know that in order to satisfy the infinite god for the offences of men the satisfaction of the incarnate god is required but by his first act my most holy son has merited more than all the human race can lose or demerit by its offences since this is sufficient tell me is it not possible that i die in order to relieve him from his death and torments my humble desires will not be annoying to my god and my anxieties will not be displeasing to him yet what am i saying and to what lengths do sorrow and love drive me since i must be subject in all things to the divine will and its perfect fulfilment such and like colloquy the most holy mary held with her angels especially during the time of her pregnancy the holy spirits met all her anxieties and comforted her with great reverence 
consoling her by renewing the memory of the very sacraments which she already knew and by reminding her of the reasonableness and propriety of the death of christ for the salvation of the human race for the conquest of the demons and spoliation of their power for the glory of the eternal father and the exaltation of the most holy and highest lord his son letter to saint timothy chapter two verse fourteen so great and exalted were the mysteries touched upon in these discourses of the queen with the holy angels that neither can the human tongue describe nor our capacity comprehend them in this life when we shall enjoy the lord we shall see what we cannot at present conceive from this little which i have said our piety can help us to draw conclusions in regard to others much greater saint elizabeth was likewise much versed and enlightened in the divine scriptures and much more so since the visitation and therefore our queen conversed with her concerning these heavenly mysteries which were known and understood by the matron instructing and enlightening her by heavenly teachings for through her intercession elizabeth was enriched with many blessings and gifts of heaven many times she wondered at the profound wisdom of the mother of god and blessed her over and over again saying blessed art thou my mistress and mother of my lord among all womankind luke chapter one verse forty two and may the nations know and magnify thy dignity most fortunate art thou on account of the rich treasure which thou bearest in thy virginal womb i tender to thee my humble and most affectionate congratulations for the joy with which thy spirit shall be filled when thou shalt hold in thy arms the son of justice and nurse him at thy virginal breasts remember me thy servant o lady in that hour and offer my heart in sacrifice to thy most holy son my true and incarnate god o oh, who shall merit to serve thee from now on and attend upon thee but if i am unworthy of this good fortune may i enjoy that of being born in thy heart for i fear not without cause that mine will be torn asunder when i must part from thee many other sentiments of sweetest and most tender love saint elizabeth uttered in her personal intercourse with the most holy mary and the most prudent lady consoled her strengthened and enlivened her by her divinely efficacious reasonings these so exalted and heavenly dealings of mary were diversified by many other acts of humility and self-abasement in serving not only her cousin elizabeth but all the servants of her house whenever she could find an occasion she swept the house of her relative and always her oratory at regular times and with the servants she washed the dishes and performed other acts of profound humility let no one think it strange that i particularize in these small matters for the greatness of our queen has made them of importance for our instruction and in order that knowing them our pride may vanish and our vileness may come to shame when saint elizabeth learnt of the humble services performed by the mother of piety she was deeply moved and tried to prevent them and therefore the heavenly lady concealed them from her cousin whenever it was possible o oh, queen and mistress of heaven and earth my protectress and advocate although thou art the teacher of all sanctity and perfection lost in astonishment at thy humility i dare o oh my mother to ask thee how was it possible that knowing of the only begotten of the father within thy virginal womb and wishing in all things to conduct thyself as his mother thy greatness should abase itself in such lowliness as sweeping the floor and similar occupations since according to our notions thou couldst on account of the reverence due to thy most holy son easily have excused thyself without failing against the duties of thy most perfect motherhood my desire is o lady to understand how thy majesty was governed in this matter answer and instruction of the queen of heaven my daughter in order to solve thy difficulty more explicitly than as already noted down in the foregoing chapter thou must remember that no occupation or exterior act pertaining to virtue no matter how lowly it may be can if it is well ordered impede the worship reverence and exaltation of the creator of all things for these acts of virtue do not exclude one another but they are all compatible with one another in the creature and much more in me who lived in the continual presence of the highest good without ever losing it out of sight by exterior activity 
I adored and remembered God in all my actions, referring them all to his greater glory, and the Lord himself, who orders and creates all things, despises none of them, nor is he offended or irritated by their smallness. The soul that loves him is not disconcerted by any of these little things in his divine presence, for it seeks and finds him as the beginning and the end of all creatures, and because terrestrial creatures cannot exist without these humble performances, and without others that are inseparable from our lowly condition, and the preservation of our nature, it is necessary to understand this doctrine well, in order that we may be governed by it. For if we engage in these thoughts and occupations without reference to their creator, they will cause many and great interruptions in the practice of virtue and in our merits, as well as in the right use of interior advantages. Our whole life will be blameworthy and full of reprehensible defects, little removed from the earthliness of creatures. According to this doctrine, thou must regulate thy terrestrial occupations, whatever they may be, that thou do not lose thy time, which can never be recovered. Whether thou eat, labor, rest, sleep, or watch, in all times and places, and in all occupations, adore, reverence, and look upon thy great and powerful Lord, who fills all things and conserves all things. First letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 3. Matthew, chapter 11, verse 29. I wish also that thou pay special attention to that which moved and incited me most to perform all acts of humility, namely, the thought that my divine Son came in the guise of humility in order to teach the world this virtue in word and example, to inculcate the hate of vanity and pride, and rooting out its seed sown by Lucifer among mortals in the first sin. His majesty gave me such a deep knowledge of how much he is pleased with this virtue, that in order to be allowed to perform only one of the acts mentioned by thee, such as sweeping the floor or kissing the feet of the poor, I would have been ready to suffer the greatest torments of the world. Thou wilt never find words to express the love for humility which I had, nor to describe its excellence and nobility. In the Lord thou wilt know and understand what thou canst not describe in words. But write this doctrine in thy heart, and observe it as the rule of thy life, continue to exercise thyself in the contempt of all things belonging to human vanity, and esteem them as odious and execrable in the eyes of the Most High. But in connection with this humility of thy life, let thy thoughts always be of the noblest, and thy conversation in heaven and with the angelic spirits. Letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 20. Deal with them and converse with them, in order to obtain new light concerning the divinity and the mysteries of Christ, my most holy Son. With creatures, let thy intercourse be such as will continually increase thy fervor, and serve thee as means of advancing and profiting by means of humility and divine love. In thy own mind, assume the lowest place beneath all creatures, so that when the occasion and the time of exercising the acts of humility arrive, thou mayest be found prompt and willing to exercise them. Only then wilt thou be the mistress of thy passions, if first thou hast acknowledged thyself in thy heart as the least and weakest and most useless of all the creatures. End of chapter 19book one chapter twenty of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter twenty some special favors which most holy mary conferred upon several persons in the house of zacharias it is a well-known quality of love to be active as the fire in works of kindness wherever it finds occasion and this is especially true of the fire of spiritual love, for it will reach out in search of material, as soon as this falls short. The master has taught lovers of God so many ways and methods of pursuing this virtue, that there is no need of remaining idle. And as love is not blind nor insane, it knows well the qualities of the noble object it aims at. Its only concern is that not all men love it properly, and thus it seeks to communicate this love without strife or envy. 
we know that the love of all the other saints though most fervent and holy appears limited in comparison with that of most holy mary yet if their love is admirable and powerful inciting them to vast works of zeal for souls what immense works then must not the love of this great queen have accomplished for the benefit of her fellow men since she was the mother of the divine love ecclesiasticus chapter twenty four verse twenty four and since she carried with her the true and living fire that was to enkindle the world luke chapter twelve verse forty nine let all the mortals learn from this heavenly history how much they owe to the love of this lady although it will be impossible to notice all the particular instances of the benefits conferred on the souls by her nevertheless in order that from some of them many more may be inferred i will relate a few that our queen conferred while in the house of her cousin elizabeth one of the servants in that house was of perverse inclination restless subject to anger and accustomed to swear and curse with all these vices and disorders she still knew how to make herself agreeable to her masters but at the same time she was so given over to the power of the demon that this tyrant could easily induce her to throw herself into all sorts of miseries and mistakes for fourteen years many devils surrounded and accompanied her without intermission in order to make certain the capture of her soul only when this woman came into the presence of the mistress of heaven most holy mary these enemies withdrew for as i have said in other places the virtue issuing from our queen tormented them and especially during that time when she carried within her virginal repository the powerful god and lord of all virtues as on the one hand this woman was freed from her cruel exactors being released from the evil influences of their company and as on the other hand she experienced within her the beneficial effects of the sweet vision and intercourse of the queen she began to be much attracted and moved toward mary and she sought to be in her presence and offered to serve her with much affection striving to pass all the time possible with her and watching her with reverence for among her disordered inclinations she also had a good one which was a natural kindness and compassion for the needy and the humble so that she was naturally drawn toward them and ready to do them good the heavenly princess who saw and knew all the inclinations of this woman the state of her conscience the danger of her soul and the malice of the demons against her turned upon her an eye of mercy and watched her with the love of a mother although her majesty knew that the company and the interference of the demons was a just punishment for the sins of this woman yet she interceded for her and obtained for her pardon remedy and salvation she commanded the demons in virtue of the authority conceded to her to leave this creature and not dare to disturb her or molest her henceforth as they could not resist the sway of our great queen they yielded and fled in highest consternation not knowing how to account for such power of the most holy mary they conferred about it in astonishment and indignation saying who is this woman that exerts such dominion over us whence does this strange power come which enables her to perform all that she wishes the demons therefore conceived new wrath and indignation against her who had crushed their heads genesis chapter three verse fifteen the happy woman however was snatched from their claws mary admonished her corrected her and taught her the way of salvation and changed her into a woman of kind and meek disposition she persevered therein during all her life being well aware that all this had come to her through the hands of our queen although she did not know nor penetrate into the mystery of her dignity she remained humbly thankful and lived a holy life not in a better state than this servant was another woman living in the neighborhood of the house of zacharias who as a neighbor was wont to come and listen to the conversation of the family of saint elizabeth she lived a licentious life far from honorable and when she heard of the arrival of our great queen in that town of her modesty and retirement she spoke of her lightly and with some curiosity who is this stranger that has come as a guest of our neighbors and who gives herself such holy and recollected airs in the vain and inquisitive desire of spying out novelty as is customary with such kind of people she managed to get sight of the heavenly lady and scrutinized her dress and her countenance 
Her intention was impertinent and presumptuous, but far different the effect. For having succeeded in scrutinizing Most Holy Mary, she left with a wounded heart. The presence and the sight of the queen transformed her into a new woman. Her inclinations were altogether changed, and without knowing by what efficacious influence the change came about, she felt its power and began to shed abundant floods of tears in deep felt sorrow for her sins. Merely on account of having fixed her attentive gaze in curiosity upon the mother of virginal purity, this happy woman received in return the love of chastity, and was freed from the sensual habits and inclinations of her former life. In that very hour, she sorrowfully retired to weep over her wicked life. Whenever later on she desired to converse with the mother of grace, her highness, in order to confirm her, permitted it. For as Mary knew what had happened, and as she bore within her the origin of grace, the sanctifier and justifier, by whose power she fulfilled her office of advocate of sinners, she received her with maternal kindness, admonished and instructed her in virtue, dismissing her strengthened and confirmed, for perseverance in her new life. In this manner our great lady performed many works, and caused many admirable conversions in a great number of souls, although it was done in silence and hidden to all. The whole family of St. Elizabeth and Zacharias were sanctified by her intercourse and conversation. Those who were just experienced new increase of gifts and favors. Those that were not, she justified and enlightened by her intercession. All of them were captured by reverential love of her so completely that each one strove to obey her and acknowledge her as mother, as protectress, and as a consolation in all their necessities. The mere privilege of seeing her, without any words, was sufficient to produce all these effects. Yet she was careful not to omit whatever seemed necessary to obtain this end. As she penetrated the secrets of all hearts, and knew the state of each one's conscience, she knew how to apply the opportune medicine. Sometimes, not always, the Lord manifested to her the final end of those she met, informing her which were chosen and which were reprobate, predestined for happiness or foreknown as damned. At the sight of both one and the other, her heart broke forth in admirable flashes of most perfect virtue. For when she knew of any that were just and predestined, she bestowed upon them many blessings, which she also does now in heaven. And the Lord looked with favor upon her beneficence. Exerting incredible and prayerful diligence, she asked him to preserve them in his grace and friendship. Whenever she saw any one in sin, she asked from the bottom of her heart for his justification, and ordinarily she also obtained it. But if it happened to be one of the reprobate, she wept bitterly and humiliated herself in the presence of the Most High, for the loss of that image and work of the divinity. She redoubled her heartfelt prayers, offerings, and humiliations, in order that no others might damn themselves, and her whole being was one flame of divine love which never rested nor reposed in accomplishing great things. Instruction which the Heavenly Queen and Lady gave me. My dearest daughter, within two limits, as if within two extremes, all the harmony of thy powers and wishes must move. They are, to preserve thyself in the grace and friendship of God, and to seek the same good fortune for others. In this, let all thy life and activity be consumed. For such high purpose, I wish that thou spare no labor, beseeching the Lord, and offering thyself in sacrifice unto death, accepting actually all that is opportune and possible. Although, in order to solicit the good of souls, thou need not make any great ado before creatures, since this is not appropriate to thy sex. Yet thou must seek and prudently apply all the hidden means that are most efficacious within thy knowledge. If thou wilt be my daughter, and a spouse of my most holy son, consider that the possessions of our house are the rational creatures, which he acquired as a rich prize at the cost of his life and of his blood. First letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 20. For through their own disobedience they were lost to him. Genesis, chapter 3, verse 6. After he had created and selected them for himself. Hence, whenever the Lord sends to thee, or throws in thy way, a needy soul, and makes thee aware of its state, labor faithfully to assist it. Pray and weep with heartfelt and fervent love, 
that god may furnish the remedy for such great and dangerous evil and do not neglect any means divine or human as far as thou art concerned in order to obtain the salvation of eternal life for the soul entrusted to thee by means of the prudence and moderation which i have taught thee thou must not grow weary in admonishing nor in praying for that which will benefit that soul and in all secrecy continue thy labor in its behalf likewise i wish that whenever it is necessary thou command the demons in the powerful name of the almighty and my own to depart and leave in peace the souls oppressed by it and as all this is to be done in secret thou canst in all propriety animate and encourage thyself to this kind of work remember that the lord has placed thee and will place thee in a position to exercise this doctrine do not forget it nor fail in understanding how much thou art bounden to his majesty to use care and solicitude in extending the possessions of thy father's house do not rest until thou accustom thyself to do this with all diligence letter to the philippians chapter four verse thirteen fear not for thou canst do all in him that strengthens thee and his power will strengthen thy arm to do great things proverbs chapter 31 verse 27 end of chapter 20book one chapter twenty one of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter twenty one saint elizabeth asks the queen of heaven to assist at her confinement and is enlightened concerning the birth of john already two months had passed since the coming of the princess of heaven into the house of holy elizabeth and the discreet matron was even now filled with grief at the thought of the departure and of the absence of the mistress of the world she dreaded the loss of so great a blessing as her presence was and with reason since she knew that it could not come within the range of human merits in her holy humility she scrutinized her heart fearing lest any fault of hers might be the cause of the setting of this beautiful moon and of the sun of justice within the virginal womb sometimes she wept and sighed in private because she could find no means of prolonging their stay which had shed much clear light of grace in her soul she asked the lord with many tears to inspire her cousin the most holy lady mary not to forsake her at least not to withdraw so soon her sweet company she served her with great reverence and solicitude and studied to oblige her it is no wonder that so saintly attentive and prudent a woman should ask for that which even the angels covet for in addition to the divine light which she had received from the holy ghost concerning the supreme dignity and sanctity of the virgin mother she had the personal experience of her most sweet intercourse and conversation and all this combined had ravished her heart so that without divine aid she could not have survived the parting after once having known and conversed with the blessed lady in order to find some consolation saint elizabeth resolved to open her heart to the heavenly lady who was however not ignorant of her sorrow and she said to her in great submission and humility cousin dear lady on account of the respect and consideration with which i am bound to serve thee i have not until now dared to speak of my desire and of the sorrow in my heart give me now the permission to relieve it by making them known the lord has condescended in his mercy to send thee hither in order that i might have unmerited blessing of conversing with thee and of knowing the mysteries which his divine providence has entrusted to thee my mistress unworthy i am to praise him eternally for this favour daniel chapter three verse fifty three thou art the living temple of his glory the ark of the testament containing the manna which is the food of the angels hebrews chapter nine verse four thou art the tablet of the true law written in his own being psalm seventy seven verse twenty five i appreciate in my lowliness how rich his majesty has made me that without my merit i should entertain in my own house the treasure of heaven and her whom he has chosen as his mother among all women 
i justly fear that i displease thee and the fruit of thy womb by my sins and that therefore thou wilt forsake thy slave withdrawing the great blessing which i now enjoy possibly if it be thy pleasure i might have the happiness of serving thee and remaining with thee all the rest of my life if it is a hardship for thee to return to thy dwelling it will be most convenient for thee to stay in my house if thou wilt call thy holy spouse joseph and live with him here as my masters i will serve you with affectionate readiness of heart although i do not merit what i ask i beseech thee not to despise my humble petition since the lord can surpass by his mercies all my merits and desires the most holy mary heard with sweetest complacency the petition of her cousin elizabeth and answered her my dearest friend of my soul thy holy wishes are acceptable in the eyes of the most high i also thank thee from my heart but in all our undertakings and resolves it is necessary that we conform to the divine will and entirely subject ourselves to it although this is the duty of all creatures thou knowest that it is my duty before all others since by the power of his arm he has raised me from the dust and in boundless love has looked upon me luke chapter one verse fifty three all my words and movements must be guided by the divine will of my lord and son and i must not desire anything except what is according to his pleasure let us present to his majesty thy desires and whatever he in his goodness shall ordain that let us execute i must also obey my spouse joseph for without his order and consent i can neither decide upon my occupations nor upon my dwelling place it is just my dearest that we obey our superiors saint elizabeth yielded to the persuasive words of the princess of heaven and answered with humble submission my lady i am ready to obey thy will and revere thy teaching i wish only once more to commend to thee my sincere affection and heartfelt devotion to thy service if my wishes cannot be fulfilled and are contrary to the will of god i desire at least if possible that thou my queen do not forsake me until my son shall come forth to the light in order that just as within my womb he has adored and recognized his redeemer in thy own so he may enjoy his divine presence and enlightenment before any other creature and that he may receive thy blessing for the first advances in life proverbs chapter sixteen verse nine by the presence of him who is to direct his footsteps and do thou the mother of grace present him to the creator and obtain from his goodness the perseverance in that grace which he received at the sound of thy sweetest voice when it came to my unworthy ears let me behold my child in thy arms where the god who made and preserves heaven and earth is likewise to rest isaiah chapter forty two verse five let not thy maternal kindness be strained or diminished by my sins deny not this consolation to me nor to my son this great happiness which as a mother i ask and unworthily desire for him most holy mary did not wish to refuse and she promised to pray the lord for the fulfilment of this request of her cousin asking her at the same time to unite her prayers with hers in order to know his most holy will accordingly the two mothers of the two most holy sons born into the world betook themselves to the oratory of the heavenly princess and presented their petitions to the most high most pure mary fell into an ecstasy wherein she was enlightened anew concerning the mysterious life and the dignity of the precursor and concerning his work in preparing the hearts of men for the reception of their redeemer and teacher and she made known to saint elizabeth these sacraments in as far as it was proper she was informed of the great sanctity of her saintly cousin also that she only had a short time while to live and that zacharias would die before her the kind mother lovingly besought the lord to assist her at her death and to fulfil her wishes in regard to her son in regard to the other fond desires the most prudent virgin made no request for in her heavenly wisdom she immediately saw that to live always in the house of her cousin was not advisable nor according to the will of the most high to these petitions his majesty answered my spouse and my dove it is my pleasure that thou assist and console my servant elizabeth at her childbirth which is to be very soon for there are only eight days left before that event 
after her son shall be circumcised thou shalt return to thy home with thy spouse joseph after his birth thou shalt offer to me my servant john in pleasing sacrifice and continue my beloved to pray to me for the salvation of souls saint elizabeth united her prayers with those of the queen of heaven and earth beseeching the lord to command his mother and spouse not to forsake her during her confinement during this prayer the lord revealed to her that her confinement was close at hand and informed her also of many other things for her relief and consolation in her anxiety most holy mary issued from her trance and having finished their prayer the two mothers conferred upon the nearness of the confinement of saint elizabeth as made known to them by the lord and anxious to make sure of her good fortune the holy matron asked our queen my lady pray tell me whether i shall have the happiness of thy assistance at my impending confinement her majesty answered my beloved cousin the most high has heard our prayers and deigned to command me to assist on that occasion this i will do not only remaining till then but also until the circumcision of thy child which will take place in fifteen days at this resolve of the most holy mary the joy of her cousin was renewed she acknowledged this great favor in humble thankfulness to the lord and to the holy queen thus rejoiced and enlivened by mutual conferences the holy matron began to prepare for the birth of her son and for the departure of her exalted cousin instruction given to me by the heavenly queen and lady mary my daughter whenever our desires arise from loving affection and are accompanied by a good intention the most high is not offended at our making them known as long as it is done with submission and resignation to the dispositions of his divine providence when the soul presents itself before the lord with such sentiments he looks upon it as a father and grants to it what is proper withholds what is improper or does not conduce to its true welfare the desire of my cousin to remain with me all her life arose from a pious and praiseworthy zeal but it was not in harmony with the plans of the most high by which he had already arranged the conduct travels and events of my life though the lord denied her this request he was not displeased but granted her whatever would not hinder the decrees of his infinite wisdom and whatever would benefit her or her son john on account of the love shown toward me by the mother and son and on account of my intercession the almighty enriched them with many blessings and favors for to ask him with upright intention and through my mediation it is always the most efficacious means of moving his majesty i wish that thou offer up all thy petitions and prayers in the name of my most holy son and my own and be assured without doubt that they will be heard if they are joined with the upright intention of pleasing god look upon me with loving affection as thy mother thy refuge and thy help trust thyself to my devoted love and remember my dearest that my desire for thy greater good urges me to teach thee the means of obtaining great blessings and favors of divine grace at the most liberal hands of god do not make thyself unfit for them nor hinder them by thy timidity and if thou wishest to induce me to love thee as my much beloved daughter rouse thyself to a fulfillment of what i tell thee and manifest to thee toward this direct thy careful efforts resting satisfied only when thou hast labored hard to put my teachings into practice end of chapter twenty one book one chapter twenty two of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter twenty two the birth of the precursor of christ and what the lady mary did on this occasion the hour for the rising of the morning sun which was to precede the clear sun of justice and announce the wish for day of the law of grace had arrived john chapter five verse thirty five the time was suitable to the most high for the appearance of his prophet in the world and greater than a prophet was john who pointed out with his finger the lamb john chapter one verse twenty nine was to prepare mankind for the salvation and sanctification of the world 
before issuing from the maternal womb the lord revealed to the blessed child the hour in which he was to commence his mortal career among men the child had the perfect use of his reason and of the divine science infused by the presence of the incarnate word he therefore knew that he was to arrive at the port of a cursed and dangerous land and to walk upon a world full of evils and snares where many are overtaken by ruin and perdition on this account the great child was as it were in a state of suspense and doubt for on the one hand nature having nourished his body to that state of perfection which is proper to birth he recognized and felt in addition to the express will of god the compelling forces of nature which urged him to leave the retreat of the maternal womb on the other hand he contemplated the dangerous risks of mortal life thus he hesitated between the fear of danger and the desire to obey and he debated within himself if i meet this danger of losing god whither shall it lead me how can i safely converse with men of whom so many are enveloped in darkness and wander from the path of life i am in the obscurity of my mother's womb but i must leave it for a more dangerous darkness i was imprisoned here since i received the light of reason but more must i dread the unrestrained freedoms of mortals but let me o lord fulfil thy will and enter the world for to execute it is always best to know that my life and my faculties shall be consumed in thy service highest king will make it easier for me to come forth to the light and begin life bestow o lord thy blessing for my passage into the world by this prayer the precursor of christ merited new graces and blessings at his birth the fortunate child knew by the indwelling of god in his mind that he was sent to perform great things and was assured of the necessary help before describing this most happy birth i will try to explain the scriptural dates concerning it it must be remembered that the miraculous pregnancy of saint elizabeth lasted nine days less than nine months for on account of the fecundity miraculously restored to a barren woman the fruit conceived matured for parturition in this shorter time when the angel gabriel announced to most holy mary that her cousin was in the sixth month of her pregnancy it must be understood to mean that eight or nine days were still wanting for the completion of the sixth month i have also said in chapter sixteen that the heavenly lady departed on the fourth day after the incarnation of the word for her visit to saint elizabeth saint luke does not say that most holy mary departed immediately but in those days and she went in haste yet she consumed four days on her journey as said in the same chapter i likewise remind the reader that when the evangelist says that holy mary remained about three months in the house of saint elizabeth there were only two or three days missing for in all respects the evangelist was exact in his words accordingly most holy mary our lady was present not only at the confinement of saint elizabeth and at the birth of john but also at the naming and circumcision of saint john as i will now show counting eight days after the incarnation of the word our lady arrived at the house of elizabeth on the evening of the second of april if we reckon according to our solar months adding thereto three months less two days we have the first of july the eighth day of the birth of st john and early next day most holy mary departed on her return to nazareth st luke mentions the return of our queen before he speaks of the birth of st john although this happened before she returned the sacred text anticipates the mention of the journey in order to have done with it and not to interrupt the thread of the narrative of the precursor's birth this is what i was told to write down in explanation of the text her time approaching saint elizabeth felt the child in motion as if he wanted to place himself on his feet but he was merely following the ordinary course of nature and the dictates of obedience some moderate pains overtook the mother and she informed the princess mary but she did not call her to be present at the birth because reverence for the dignity of mary and for the fruit within her womb prudently withheld her from asking what might not seem befitting nor was the great mistress in the same room but she sent her the coverings and swaddling clothes which she had made for the fortunate child 
Presently thereafter he was born, very perfect and complete in shape, and by the freedom from impure matter showed signs of the purity of his soul. He was wrapped in the coverings sent by Mary, which therefore had already been great and venerable relics. Shortly after, when St. Elizabeth had composed herself, Most Holy Mary, at the command of the Lord, issued from her oratory in order to pay her visit to the mother and child and give them her blessing. At the request of his mother, the queen received in her arms the newborn child and offered him as a new oblation to the eternal father, and his majesty, well pleased, accepted it as the first fruits of the incarnation and of the divine decrees. The most blessed child, full of the Holy Ghost, acknowledged his sovereign queen, showing her not only interior, but outward reverence by a secret inclination of his head, and again he adored the divine word, which was manifested to him in her womb by an especial light. And as he also was aware that he was privileged before all men, the grateful child performed acts of fervent thanksgiving, humility, love and reverence of God and of his virgin mother. The heavenly queen, in offering him to the eternal father, pronounced this prayer for him. Highest Lord and Father, all holy and powerful, accept in thy honor this offering and seasonable fruit of thy most holy Son and my Lord. He is sanctified by the only begotten, and rescued from the effects of sin, and from the power of thy ancient enemies. Receive this morning's sacrifice, and infuse into this child the blessings of thy Holy Spirit, in order that he may be a faithful minister to thee and thy only begotten. This prayer of our Queen was efficacious in all respects, and she perceived how the Lord enriched this child, chosen as his precursor, and she also felt, within herself, the effects of these admirable blessings. While the Queen of the Universe held the infant in her arms, she was for a short time secretly wrapped in sweetest ecstasy. During it, she offered up this prayer for the child, holding it close to the same breast where the only begotten of the eternal and her own was soon to rest. This was the singular prerogative of the great precursor, granted to none among the saints. Therefore it is not surprising that the angel called him great in the eyes of the Lord, for before he was born, the Lord visited and sanctified him, and being born, he was placed on the throne of grace, he was embraced by the arms, which were to enfold the incarnate word God, and thereby excited in the sweetest mother of God, the entrancing desire of holding within them, the Son of the Most High, filling her with delightful affections for his precursor, the newborn child. Saint Elizabeth, being divinely informed of these sacraments, beheld her wonderful child in the arms of her, who was his mother, in a more exalted sense than she herself, she being his mother only, as to his natural being, while most holy Mary held that position as to his existence in the order of grace. All this caused a most sweet tie of affection between the most blessed women and in the child, who likewise was enlightened in regard to these mysteries. By the motions of his tender body, he manifested the joy of his spirit, clinging to the heavenly lady and seeking to attract her caresses and to remain with her. The sweetest lady fondled him, but with such majestic moderation, that she did not kiss him, as his age would have permitted, for she preserved her most chaste lips intact for her most holy son. Nor did she look intently into his face, directing all her intention to the holiness of his soul. So great was the prudence and modesty of the great queen of heaven in the use of her eyes, that she would scarcely have known him by sight. When the birth of John became known, all the relations and acquaintances, as St. Luke says, gathered to congratulate St. Zacharias and Elizabeth. For his house was rich, noble and honored in the whole province, and their piety attracted the hearts of all that knew them. Having known them so many years without children, and being aware of the sterility and advanced age of Elizabeth, all were stirred to amazement and joyful wonder, and they looked upon the birth of the child rather as a miracle than as a natural event. The holy priest Zacharias remained mute and unable to manifest his joy by word of mouth, for the hour of his miraculous cure had not arrived. But freed of his incredulity, he showed his joy in other ways, 
and he was full of affectionate gratitude and praise for the rare blessing which he had now witnessed with his own eyes his behavior shall be described in the next chapter instruction which the queen of heaven gave me my dearest daughter do not be surprised that my servant john feared and hesitated to come into the world life can never be loved by the ignorant devotee of the world in the same degree as the wise in divine science abhor and fear its dangers this science was eminently possessed by the precursor of my most holy son hence knowing of the loss which threatened he feared the risk but since he that knows and dreads the treacherous seas of this world sails so much the more securely over their unfathomed depths it served him in good stead for entering securely into the world the fortunate child began his career with such disgust and abhorrence of all earthly things that his horror never abated he made no peace with the flesh mark chapter six verse seventeen nor partook of its poison nor allowed vanity to enter his senses or obstruct his eyes in abhorrence of the world and of earthly things he gave his life for justice the citizen of the true jerusalem cannot be in peace or in alliance with babylon nor is it possible to enjoy at the same time the grace of the most high and the friendship of his declared enemies for no one can serve two hostile masters nor can light and darkness christ and belial harmonize matthew chapter four verse four guard thyself my dearest against those living in darkness and the lovers of the world more than against fire for the wisdom of the sons of this world is carnal and diabolical and their ways lead to death in order to walk the way of truth even at the cost of the natural life it is necessary to preserve the peace of the soul three dwelling places i point out for thee to live in from which thou must never intentionally come forth if at any time the lord should bid thee to relieve the necessities of thy fellow-creatures i desire that thou do not lose this refuge act as one who lives in a castle surrounded by enemies and who perchance must go to the gate to transact necessary business he acts with such wariness that he will pay more attention to safeguard his retreat and shield himself than to transact business with others being always on the watch and on guard against danger so must thou live if thou wishest to live securely for doubt not that enemies more cruel and poisonous than asps and basilisks surround thee thy habitation shall be the divinity of the most high the humanity of my most holy son and thy own interior in the divinity thou must live like the pearl in its shell or like the fish in the sea allowing thy desires and affections to roam in its infinite spaces the most holy humanity shall be the wall which defends thee and his bosom shall be the place of thy rest and under his wings shall thou find refreshment psalm sixteen verse eight thy interior shall afford thee peaceful delight through the testimony of a good conscience first letter to the corinthians chapter two verse twelve and it will if thou keep it pure familiarize thee with the sweet and friendly intercourse of thy spouse in order that thou mayest be aided therein by retirement of the body i desire that thou remain secluded in thy choir or in thy cell leaving it only when obedience or charity make it inevitable i will tell thee a secret there are demons whom lucifer has expressly ordered to watch for the religious who come forth from their retirement in order to beset them and engage them in battle and cause their fall the demons do not go easily into cells because they do not find the occasions afforded by conversations and the use of the senses wherein they ordinarily capture and devour their prey like ravenous wolves they are tormented by the retirement and recollection of religious knowing that they are foiled in their attempts as long as they cannot entice them into human discourse it is also certain that ordinarily the demons have no power over souls unless they gain entrance by some venial or mortal fault mortal sin gives them a sort of direct right over those who commit it while venial sin weakens the strength of the soul and invites their attacks imperfections diminish the merit and the progress of virtue and encourage the enemy 
whenever the astute serpent notices that the soul bears with its own levity and forgets about its danger it blinds it and seeks to instill its deadly poison the enemy then entices the soul like a little heedless bird until it falls into one of the many snares from which there seems to be no escape admire then my daughter what thou hast learned by divine enlightenment and weep in deepest sorrow over the ruin of so many souls absorbed in such dangerous tepidity they live in the obscurity of their passions and depraved inclinations forgetful of the danger unmoved by their losses and heedless of their dealings instead of fearing and avoiding the occasions of evil they encounter and seek for them in blind ignorance in senseless fury they follow their pleasures place no restraint on their passionate desires and care not where they walk even if to the most dangerous precipices they are surrounded by innumerable enemies who pursue them with diabolical treachery unceasing vigilance unquenchable wrath and restless diligence what wonder then that from such extremes or rather from such unequal combat irreparable defeats should arise among the mortals and that since the number of fools is infinite the number of the reprobate should also be uncountable and that the demon should be inflated by his triumphs in the perdition of so many men may the eternal god preserve thee from such a misfortune and do thou weep and deplore that of thy brethren continually asking for their salvation as far as is possible End of chapter 22